Hi, uh, th thanks for your introduction. Uh, I just want to get a sense of uh, who all are in the uh, audience. How many of you are from Berlin? All right. Interesting. OK. And uh, how many of you are uh, aware of uh, the big data stuff, like, or at least have worked on like Hadoop or HBase or Storm or Kafka? Like, Cool. A lot of you. Cool. Awesome. Uh, that makes my life uh, easier. <laughs> Uh, let's see. So let me introduce myself a little bit more. Uh, or I'll just wait for a few more seconds till people settle in. One more question. How many of you know Groupon? <laughs> no, I'm not advertising. But uh, that way I can skip some of the parts and go to the main stuff. Uh, but now I'm advertising, I'll advertise. Uh, we have office here in Berlin, <laughs> a Groupon office. But I, I work in San Francisco office. Uh, and uh, all right, I'll start now. Uh, so I, I'm, a, I'm a lead engineer on the real-time infrastructure at Groupon. Uh, so let me go back a little bit. We, we are about six years old now, uh, Groupon. And, uh, we have been through, you know, sort of a lot of changes. You know, you call them pivots or whatever. Uh, uh, but when we started, uh, Groupon started with a very simple model, uh, like something like this. You know, you have one deal a day. Uh, this is some uh, ki ki so some kiteboarding deal or something like that. Uh, and uh, what we'll do is that we'll have one deal a day. It will be like fifty dollars, a hundred for fifty dollars or something like that. And uh, we'll send out this deal to all our users that day. Uh, and a lot of people will buy them, and a lot of people will not buy them, right? And as Groupon grew very quickly, uh, we, we amassed a lot of users in a lot of cities. So to give you an example, in San Francisco, we had over a million users in, I don't know, like under eight months or something like that. Uh, so what, what that means is that you know, uh, it, it kind of became much harder to scale at that point, uh, and it created sort of a lose-lose-lose situation from a business standpoint. Uh, and let me explain you how. So let's say we ran a massage deal, and we'll sell, say, a, a, whatever, $50 massage, for a 50 euro massage for hun uh, worth 100 euro, something like that, to a million people in, uh, say, Berlin. And what would happen is that you know, for a lot of them, it's a relevant deal, right? So they, they will stop opening their emails or something like that. Uh, but out of a million users, you know, a lot of people will actually buy them, right? So let's say we sold 7,000 massage or spa appointments. Uh, now the, the 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 small business that is going to serve those appointments, they're not going to sell it. They're not going to serve that many appointments easily, right? So it's bad for uh, the the business that we are uh, uh, doing Groupon for. It's bad for customers because they're getting a lot of irrelevant emails, and uh, it's bad for uh, Groupon because we could only run one deal a day uh, in a large city like Berlin or large city like San Francisco. So this became kind of a lose 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 situation. Uh, and uh, we, 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 we had to come up with something so that you know, it, 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 it becomes much easier for everybody. So one idea of doing that was, OK, let's, uh, instead of running one deal a day, let's run multiple deals a day. Right? Uh, so that idea sounded easy. The problem is that you know, in order to do that, you, know, you have to match the, the deals uh, to the right users. Right? If, you have the, uh, uh, if you can match the right deal to the right user, then we come from that lose-lose-lose situation I just explained to sort of a win-win-win situation. So the users will get more relevant deals. The business can handle only as many customers as they want to handle, or uh, as few as uh, uh, more or less, right? And for Groupon, we could scale with uh, uh, more, more deals uh, uh, without necessarily going into more cities, right? Uh, so great idea. Uh, so the reason I'm uh, emphasizing on this is because, you know, for a lot of other businesses, uh, the relevance or recommendation systems are kind of uh, an optimization layer on top of their business model. Uh, maybe for Amazon, like because you also bought or something like that. But for Groupon, it's, it's a fundamental part of our business model itself. Uh, without these systems, uh, Groupon cannot exist, right? All right, cool. So in order to do that, you know, what, what are the things we need to build so that we could uh, build this relevant system? Uh, there are sort of uh, uh, two parts to it. One is that you know, when uh, uh, the, 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 you, if, you, if you build a good graph about users, like what, what those users are, what each user likes, what their uh, preferences are, 
Uh, and you also go and, and build a good understanding about the deals, like what kind of a deal it is, uh, where it's located, what price it is, what category it is, uh, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, then, if, then, then if you match these users to these deals, then we can get started with some sort of a relevant system, right? So those are the fundamental parts of our relevant scenario, uh, where you build some understanding about users and you build some understanding about deals. The other part of this is that once you build that, uh, there are two sort of systems from which we have to deliver these uh, uh, recommendations or uh, personalization aspects, right? One is the email, uh, where, which uh, Groupon relied on for the uh, first half of its uh, life. Uh, all, uh, we still rely on it, but it's much less now. Uh, so that was the email system, or we call it offline system. So every day we'll, we'll go and uh, you know, generate new emails, new personalized emails for everyone, uh, and we'll compute you know, what would be the best deal for you amongst the deals we have. And the other scenario is you open your Groupon app or you go to a Groupon website, and then that particular experience is personalized for you. So that's more of a real-time um, personalization system. right? So we had sort of two systems. So, I'll give you a little bit of a history on like how these systems started, and this mostly this talk is uh, how we moved from the older system we had to the new system we have now, which is more real time. So uh, uh, about two years ago, we we had something system something like this. Uh, most of our business was relied on uh, emails, so uh, we had this uh, pipeline of you know all this data pipeline, which will bring all the data about users, uh, email records, what emails we have sent you. Uh, which what emails you have opened, which you have not opened, uh, what things you have clicked on, uh, so on and so forth. And uh, data about deals, and uh, that data pipeline would bring all this data, would put this into a Hadoop system. And in Hadoop, we'll run some MapReduce jobs to compute uh, what goes into your email. And uh, those emails will be sent out next day. So this was kind of a delayed pipeline, about a day worth of delay. Uh, this, use, this used to take quite a long time, I think like 12 or 15 hour jobs uh, on a quite a large cluster, and then emails will be sent out. A real-time scenario was uh, far less uh, advanced. Uh, so what we used to do is that we will compute some of this, and part of this was dumped into MySQL store, and then we had some API on top that would serve out uh, the, the app, uh, the, 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 the website or the app. Uh, there are two more things happened during this time. One is that you know when, when we built this system, you know, uh, this was more like 2012 scenario when we built that. Uh, this this is how 2012 looked for us. You know, like very few deals. Like we moved away from daily deal to a few more deals, right? Uh, but we still had you know like uh, uh, like eight or ten thousand deals total on our platform, right? In a given city, we would only have you know like 20 deals or something like that. Uh, but that moved to uh, much longer. So today we have, uh, I think, over 200,000 deals, and there may be more now. Uh, and some of the cities have even thousands of deals. Um, so we had to scale on the, uh, on the business side where the, the, the structure of the problem has changed. Earlier problem was given this user, and out of 10 deals, which is the best deal to send, right? Now the problem is given this user, and it's hundreds of thousands of deals, which is the best deal to choose for this user, right? Which is, uh, which is not scaling from zero to a million or something, but it's still significantly different than uh, what we initially uh, started out with. Uh, because we initially started out with some, something simple, like, okay, just for loop over all the deals, score each deal, and the best deal is at the top, right? But when you have hundreds of thousands of deals, you can't just for loop over it, right? Uh, the other, other fundamental business change happened was that people started moving from email to uh, uh, web app or mobile, right? The mobile change. Uh, so today we have over 110 million subscribers, but what that means is that people are no longer, you know, like uh, opening their emails or not as opening as much of emails, but rather checking things on the app. Uh, so what that means, this uh, crappy architecture for real-time scenario wouldn't work, right? Where uh, I'll get into some of the issues with this, but uh, the clear problem here is this MySQL guy, right, which doesn't scale much. Uh, so in order to uh, keep users engaged, uh, we have to have much better real-time uh, personalization scenario. Otherwise, uh, we'll be in a bit of a trouble. <clears throat> it's the same thing, growth in mobile business, reduced dependence on email marketing, change in strategy from daily deal marketplace to uh, 
the reason I'm uh, explaining this is a lot of times what happens is you have systems and then business changes. And then you have to have, uh, you have to respond uh, how you change your technology to respond to your business, right? So this is kind of a, okay. So what were the issues with the old system? Uh, the first issue is this data pipeline which is uh, if you open an email or if you click on some a web page or something like that, we wouldn't know about it for almost a day or even sometimes longer, right? So the data comes a day later, and then we uh, compute emails for you, which takes another 14, 15 hours, and then we send out an email. So if you do some actions on Monday, you won't see a results of, uh, for which on, until Wednesday, right? <laughs> so many times the deals are expired by that time. So it's kind of useless. Uh, the other thing is this uh, MySQL store, right? So it had some basic data, like some gender and location and something like that. But it was very hard to uh, go uh, uh, scale this. I mean, you could, but at least for us, out of the box, to scale MySQL as is to you know 200 million users uh, with all the real-time aspects that we wanted to bring in. So this, this system is not scaling. Business is changing. We have to do something. All right. So we started out with uh, thinking, okay, what, what would be the ideal system? You know, uh, if we want to uh, build this again, and if we want to build this right, what, how would it look like that would scale for us? So here are the, our uh, sort of our wish list. So uh, common data store that serves uh, both online and offline systems. So remember, here the problem is that we have this Hadoop system, which is uh, completely disconnected to the, uh, the real-time system. So our wish list is okay. We don't want like two separate pipelines, one going for emails, one going for app. Let's, let's have a common one. Uh, well, data store that scales to hundreds of millions of records, uh, which was this uh, MySQL issue I mentioned earlier. Uh, data store that plays well with our existing Hadoop-based system. So we had a lot of data scientists and uh, engineers who had written a lot of algorithms. We didn't want to just throw it away, right? And that, that was written in Java MapReduce kind of a system. So we don't want to, you know, just completely just throw that away and start from scratch. Uh, so let's build a system that plays well with that infrastructure. And we want this to be real time, right? We don't want this a day delay. You know, if you, if you make certain actions on the previous page, uh, the next time you go to the website or next page you go to, we want that to be incorporated in our, our uh, algorithms, right? Uh, or in, at least or in our experience. So what that also means is that we should be able to handle at about 100,000 uh, messages per second, right? All right, cool. Those are, uh, that's a wish list. It's good to start with a wish list. So this is what we came up with. And uh, I won't spend a lot of time on uh, explaining why certain components we used and not the other competing components. Uh, but I'll tell you, like now we, have, we are using these components, what were the issues in scaling this and uh, uh, what are some of the learnings we had, right? So let me explain how, uh, how, how, what this system is about. So uh, we have these website logs and mobile logs and also the email logs, and they go into Kafka. Uh, and from Kafka, uh, we, we read into Storm. So Storm is a real-time sort of a processing system. Kafka is like a messaging system uh, for locks. Uh, and we dump them into HBase. And uh, uh, we, 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 would, we would write some MapReduce, our algorithms that we were written in MapReduce, they could run on this data inside HBase and uh, generate emails. And uh, for online, uh, online personalization, that data will be in HBase, so uh, you can just read from HBase and serve your uh, web app or a mobile app, right? Okay, it sounded good. Uh, a lot of these components are kind of default, uh, so I'll just give, uh, give you an idea about that. So Kafka is a great system for uh, moving logs from one place to other. I think it's a clear winner now. So there's not much of a choice. Uh, Storm, you can perhaps consider other systems, but we chose Storm. Uh, and I'll get into what was our experience with Storm. Uh, HBase, uh, the reason H we chose HBase was because it, it's in the same Hadoop family and it had native MapReduce integration, it built on Hadoop, we had already had a Hadoop cluster, so it was easier to go with that. Cool, so uh, sounds good, if we do put this together, it should probably work, right? Okay, but let's see what were the issues. So first issue, like let's say if we have HBase, uh, which, uh, we, what, what do we need to do with that HBase? First, it needs to handle 100,000 writes per second. So if we, if we have all the data coming from all web apps and mobile apps and email coming in real time, uh, at the peak, we, we have to write 100,000 writes per second into HBase, otherwise we would be behind real time, right? 
And uh, if we, if, if uh, let's say we achieve that, uh, then what we need to do is that because it's also a serving layer for the real-time website, uh, it needs to ha it needs to keep a very tight SLA on lat read latencies, while our MapReduce jobs are running on the cluster. So if you have a MapReduce job that's running on the HBase cluster, computing your recommendations, uh, and and also users who are also being served uh, uh, on the app or website. The latencies needs to be uh, consistent, and they cannot just exceed your SLA. Uh, and sometimes, you know, like we will also have a bunch of data that will compute offline in the MapReduce cluster, and will upload back into EdgeBase to be served uh, uh, in the real time. Now, now again, that those latencies needs to be uh, within your SLA. Okay, so uh, it didn't work just how we imagined initially, right? We couldn't write hundred thousand messages per second as is. And when the MapReduce job started running on HBase, uh, the latencies went to the roof. All right, so what do we do? So this is what we did to uh, write 100,000 writes per second. So the data, data is very simple. So you, the key is a user key. And uh, the, the data we want to write in that uh, for value is just user events. So user clicked on this page, clicked on this deal, opened this thing, email, opened this email, received this email, blah, blah, blah. So, uh, or purchase this deal or something like that, right? So the, the data is pretty straightforward. It's just, uh, if I read that user's data, then we get all the data about that user. Uh, so one way to do that is uh, perhaps have some sort of a, a read and then write thing. So um, you, you read the data from, uh, from uh, in a, for that key, you update the new event and you write it back. Uh, we found out that it's, it's very hard to do that at 100,000 writes per second. So what we do now is uh, EdgeBase comes with this uh, sort of a concept of dynamic columns uh, or you know qualifiers. So you have a column family, but within that column family, you can write whatever column name you want. So EdgeBase is kind of a hash map of a hash map. So all right, so we said good. If we can come up with a sort of a unique uh, column name uh, or qualifier name, then we can just keep on appending data for that user. So here's an example. Let's say this user. Uh, looked at some sort of a deal uh, and clicked on a deal, then for this user, we'll create this uh, uh, column name. So it's a timestamp uh, in, uh, in milliseconds, a deal ID, and an event type, right? So whatever that event type is. Excuse me. Uh, whatever that event type is. So that way we could keep on writing as many events as we want. Uh, and with some, some amount of buffering, uh, like two second buffering or one second buffering, we could write 100,000 messages per second. Good, so that solved the first problem. Uh, what about the next problem? Uh, that was relatively easy to solve. So all we did is that uh, we just put two clusters. Uh, one is a real-time cluster and the other is a batch cluster. And uh, we use the ready-made replication that HBase comes with. Uh, so all the data will go, all the, all the data will be written into this edge base and get replicated to batch edge base. All the map reduces will run on this edge base. So, because of that, we we don't have to worry about uh, how the latencies are affected on edge base, right? So, because it's in a separate cluster. And then uh, we'll use the the functionality that edge base comes with called bulk upload. So, what it does is that it creates whatever you want to write in uh, in, in a direct edge file, so the underlying format of edge base. Uh, in a separate MapReduce job, and then it just copies those files, uh, literally just like a disk copy, uh, like a Hadoop, Hadoop copy, and uh, it brings all the data in. So like we could, you could, I mean in our cluster, we could copy, you know, like 100 gigs of data into HBase cluster in under like, I don't know, 10, 15 seconds, right? Because it's literally just a copy. There's nothing, you can just rename the file, that's it. So um, cool, so we could write 100,000 writes per second. We could load a bunch of data into HBase in real time. And now the edge base park works perfect. So let's that. So edge base is kind of a user side story, right? So user and all the data about users, and we could run MapReduce to find user personalization and all that stuff. So the other part, interesting part is the deal side, right? So let's see what that part is. So uh, I'll give you an idea about what relevancy is, or what is the sort of intuition behind these uh, relevance algorithms. Uh, so we said, okay, if we if we uh, if we know, you know, like for example, questions to these uh, answers to these questions, like say, how do women in Bar Berlin convert for pizza deals, right? Uh, or uh, how are women in Bar Berlin are converting for a particular pizza deal? You know, a conversion rate being, you know, say if we show this deal to 100 users, how many of them are buying? You know, that's your conversion rate. Uh, 
uh, then we could potentially start thinking about how we can use the relevance algorithms, right? Uh, we could make it more uh, interesting and add a few more dimensions to it. So let's see how that works. So how are women in uh, Berlin from uh, Mitte area, uh, age 45 to 50, convert for New York style pizza when deal is located within two miles and when deal is priced between 10 or 20 euros, right? So you added more dimensions. Uh, and imagine, you know, if you have answers to these questions, like you know uh, uh, for all these attributes, uh, what is the conversion rate? And you take a user and you find which uh, bucket that user belongs to in all those attributes and find which deal is converting best for that user, you potentially have a ranking, right? Um, what we found out is that you can't just uh, keep it at a category level. So this is just a category level at a pizza, right? Or a New York style pizza or something like that. Each deal performs very differently. So to give you an example, a, uh, uh, a neighborhood coffee shop deal performs much differently than, a, say, a Starbucks deal, right? So deals are very different, bo although both are coffee deals, right? So we can't just keep it at the um, complete at a category level, but we want to. We need to compute these things at a, um, uh, a deal level, not just a complete category level. So the same thing, but uh, so everything on the left side, on the right hand side, it, only that it's for a particular uh, deal. More, more, but but this is not enough, right? So we wanted to do more complex stuff. So here is an example. So uh, so how how are women in Berlin from a particular area, age 45 to 50, convert for New York style pizza when deal is located within two miles, and when deal is priced between 10 and 20 euros, and the user likes activities such as biking, and who have been very active user of Groupon, and they surf on mobile platform, right? Something like that. The problem is that you know you start with very something simple, right? You started with you know pizza deal for women, right? And now you have added these extra dimensions. Now the problem is that this is actually an exponential problem because every time you add an, a dimension, it, it you know two uh, two genders, and then you add a, uh, you know like a, an area, then two into that number of areas you have. Ooh, I went just all the way back into uh, locations, into price categories, into age categories. Uh, and what we found out was that you know if we have to answer all these questions, we have to compute probably you know like 15 or 20 billion different uh, events uh, or, or separate buckets in order to answer those questions. So we said, okay, that's an interesting problem. Okay, let's try to solve that. Uh, just before that, this is what I mean by a conversion rate: number of purchases in that bucket over number of impressions. Impression can be anything. Every time you see something or on email, web, or mobile, we count it as an impression, right? And then every time you purchase, that's a conversion. So uh, how many times you saw it, how many times you bought it or, or in that bucket. So uh, I'll come, come to you know, how we solved that 15 billion uh, different buckets question. But let's first talk about how, how to uh, compute these uh, different buckets in real time, right? We want to do this in real time. So the moment deal is launched, within 15 or 20 minutes, we have a good idea about that deal, and we can target it better, right? So this is what we used. Uh, remember I mentioned earlier we, had, we have Kafka, which, uh, which has a stream of events. So we can just plug into that stream and get all the data. Uh, so that's the uh, Kafka part. Then we have a storm. Uh, one of the topology writes into HBase, but that's the user side. We are talking about deal side now. So what we do in that topology is that, you know, okay, we say fine, we'll, we'll, we'll read the event, and then we'll, if we can increase the appropriate counter, uh, then we have a conversion rate. Remember, conversion rate is just a counter, right? So if we could just count how many impressions uh, we have in each bucket and how many purchases in each bucket, the problem is solved. This is really a counting problem. This is not any harder than that. Just that the problem is hard because we are dealing with a lot of data across a lot of buckets. So, so we used a, a Redis for uh, counting. So HBase is good for 100,000 writes per second and all that stuff, but for this, we, uh, we needed about 3 million updates per second, right? Because the problem is that, you know, when an when a, when a event comes, say, uh, this particular user bought this deal, it's not just one event, uh, it gets into multiple uh, buckets. So that user is also a male, that user is from this area, this deal is this price, and we have to count against all those buckets, right? Not just one bucket. So um, we had to write or update about three million times per second. So, so we use Redis for that. So this is the high level, high level idea. So uh, data we read from Kafka stream. In analytics topology, we decide which uh, exact buckets to increment increment our counters, and then we write into Redis. 
uh, this is kind of the same, just I just described. Kafka, read data events in Kafka, find which buckets event falls into, increase event counter for appropriate buckets in Redis. And uh, Redis, a single Redis was not enough, so we did our own sharding on the client side, uh, and we updated that data in Redis. Cool. So uh, I'll just go into you know some of the scaling challenges. So that that's really it. You know, like how uh, the, it's really simple. The data comes in. We decide which buckets to update. We update the counter. Done. Right. If we do that for all users uh, and against all buckets, the problem is solved. You have the relevant system, which is real time. Well, as it turned out, you know every component is not that straightforward to uh, scale. So that's the scaling part I'm talk going to talk about. So the, one of the first issues uh, is uh, the Kafka and Storm part, the scaling of Kafka and Storm part. Um, in Groupon, we have a sort of a centralized Kafka cluster where you know all the data comes there. Uh, and I don't work on that team, but they kind of manage our scaling, and which is a very nice setup for us to have. Uh, but the, the challenging part was uh, Storm, uh, uh, especially when the messages count became, you know, like 100,000 messages per second and then 2 million updates per uh, second uh, and all that stuff. The, the Storm became harder to scale. Uh, the problem is that, you know, in real-time systems, uh, you have to manage the flow. So you have, say, uh, step one, two, and three, and step three is slightly slower, then it creates back pressure on step two. And if step two is now slower, it creates a back pressure on step one, because there are only so many events in a funnel you can have, right? And uh, you have to sort of adjust, you know, like uh, based on your computation, you know, each, uh, each step may take more or less time, right? And you have to sort of adjust uh, how many bolts you need uh, in each step. And uh, that becomes kind of a challenge, you know, we, we spend a lot of time uh, tuning that. Uh, there are other things that you have to make sure, for example, the um, try to do a localized, uh, so uh, let's say this is all distributed systems, right? So from step one, uh, you move on to step two. If possible, uh, make sure that you send that data from step one to step two on the same machine instead of through the network, because then the network becomes a bottleneck. Um, so for example, if you just implement Storm as is uh, out of default, it has kind of a random uh, passing the messages. And what we saw is that our network was out of bandwidth, right, very quickly. And then we moved to this kind of localized thing and, you know, we opt it came down to like 20% of what it was earlier, right? So there are like a lot of little, little things that you have to do for a storm to work at that, this scale. Uh, there were other things like, uh, uh, because the speed of each processing uh, part is different, you, you have to sort of uh, stop how many messages you are getting into the uh, storm system. Otherwise, the spout that you have, it keeps on getting messages, and if the messages are not getting processed, you know, it just creates a lot of RAM pressure or memory pressure, and you know, bad things happen. So there, there are settings like uh, use max spout pending, etc. Basically, that stops how many unprocessed messages you have in your topology. Uh, okay, so here is another interesting part. Uh, what happens is that you know uh, all these systems are uh, distributed and they do not give you any guarantees of uh, uh, the, most of them give you at least once guarantee right but they don't give you at uh, exactly once guarantee uh, so what i uh, what i mean by that is that you can get duplicate messages uh, so which is now an interesting problem because if you count purchases twice uh, your conversion rates are completely going to be wrong right um, so what do we do with that with EdgeBase, that was easy because uh, if the message comes again, we'll create the same uh, uh, same column name for it. So we'll just overwrite that message. So it's not a problem on EdgeBase side, but the problem is definitely there in the anal this uh, Redis analytics topology that I just explained, uh, because uh, now your uh, counters are going to be wrong, right? Um, so what we do is we use uh, Bloom filters. Uh, so it kind of c covers you know 99.9 percent of uh, duplicate error cases, but this is something to remember. If you're building these systems, uh, you're, you, you have to build it so that you know that there, um, there will be duplicate messages, there will be delayed messages, and your system needs to adjust to that. Redis. So Redis is uh, uh, interesting, right? Because the the pr fundamental part of uh, scaling Redis was uh, managing our memory footprint, because as I mentioned, you know we had these 14 billion different buckets or something like that. Uh, if we just use another, like a normal Redis key for 14 billion buckets, the, the memory footprint was huge, right? 
Um, and what we found out uh, in Redis is that they have this nice hash, hash functionality where um, you have sort of a top level key and like inside you have another hash. If you use that, uh, you could potentially reduce your memory footprint by a factor of 100, uh, or at least uh, you know, 50 or something like that, but, but by a huge margin. So we are talking about instead of using 200 machines, using 20 machines. Right? So it's much, much, much big, uh, it's a huge difference. And the reason it, it works that way is because um, like things like expiry, expiry and all that stuff is maintained at, at the top level hash key instead of at each key level. So uh, um, you can use Redis with hashes to have multiple different keys, but your overall mem memory footprint would be much, much less. You know? um, the other issue we have with the system is that, you know, like uh, in order to even keep Redis uh, up and keep on going, uh, Redis comes up with sort of two um, uh, persistent formats. One is called uh, AOF, which is every time you write, uh, Redis updates the disk uh, and, you know, writes that thing. And the other is uh, RDB, which is kind of a snapshotting system. So you can say every five minutes or every 20 minutes, take a dump from memory into disk, and uh, that's what you have. So what we did is that we uh, we turned off AOF. Uh, so not every not every operation gets to the disk right away. Uh, we we have we kind of lazy implementation here. So if say something breaks for 15 minutes, then we kind of lose data for 15 minutes. Uh, but but that way we could we could scale Redis. The other thing is that I want to mention is that Redis was probably the easiest for us to scale. I mean it it really has no overhead. You just start and it just works. I think I just briefly mentioned about uh, bloom filters, uh, but uh, they, they are very handy. You can, uh, especially for systems like these, you know, your overall memory f deduplication is a huge problem, and uh, we could solve that pretty quickly with uh, this. Uh, another interesting part about this system is that uh, the, the architecture of the system is relatively simple because it's just Kafka Storm Redis, and the other part is just Kafka Storm HBase. Uh, the problem is that the error scenarios, right? Because this is a real-time system. If something happens, something wrong happens, you have to make sure you can come back to it uh, at a reasonable level. Uh, and because a lot of business and a lot of revenue is actually riding on these systems. So uh, bringing systems back to the correct uh, status is uh, very critical. So how do we do that? Um, so Redis, I mentioned, you know, we have these RDB backups. So what we do is we have a slave Redis also, which gets uh, replicated. Uh, and we take these RDB backups and copy them to a Hadoop cluster HDFS every, I think, 20 minutes or something like that. So if something happens, we can go back to the state where whatever Redis was 20 minutes ago or at each 20 minute interval for, I think, last seven days or something like that. HBase, uh, HBase comes up with a snapshot functionality. So you can tell HBase to take a snapshot at uh, whatever time you want. And you can just tell HBase to go back to that snapshot. So let's say um, something happened, some bad data is coming. Remember, the data that we have, we don't control the data. You know, whoever is writing the mobile app, whoever is writing the web app, they are doing the log. And this is all log-based data, right? So it's very possible that somebody writes some bad code and we get bad data, right? So let's say some da bad data is coming. As long as we are taking these snapshots, we can say, oh, the dad, bad data is coming from you know, yesterday at 2 o'clock or something. So we just take all our systems, rewind back to 2 o'clock based on these snapshots, and we replay the data uh, when the, that problem is fixed, and we get all the right data. Right? Um, Kafka and Storm. So we, what we also have is uh, uh, on the Kafka, we have a, a topic that reads from Kafka and writes to HDFS. So all the data that's coming to Kafka, because the Kafka has some, I think, three-day expiry or something like that, so we don't have all the data inside Kafka. But all the data inside Kafka gets to HDFS. So let's say you want to uh, replay data from two weeks ago for that two hours period which, which where we had a bad data, we could potentially do that. Right? We could just replay that data from HDFS back into Kafka, back into the system. Uh, one more interesting thing we did is that you know we wrote a lot of monitors and uh, CPU monitors, this monitor, that monitor. Uh, but there was another interesting monitor we wrote, and uh, in practicality, uh, that was the most important monitor we had written. And what we did that, what, we, what was that monitor was, we actually wrote a crawler that goes and crawls our website or a mobile app, and then we check back uh, in HBase if those events have arrived. Right? And it checks continuously every two minutes or something like that. So we, we crawl our own website, we 
fake uh, buy our uh, fake we, we fake the purchases of fake deals and then we check back in edge base and with that what happens is kind of an integration sort of a monitor test whatever you call it but it checks the whole thing you know it checks the app it checks the website it checks kafka it checks tom it checks edge base it checks redis you know it checks the whole thing and if something is wrong somewhere there are so many moving components if something is wrong somewhere, you find out within a couple of minutes that something is wrong, right? And then we just go back and say, oh, okay, we have to stop this now, we'll see what happens and all that stuff. So that, that, that's a very uh, useful monitor we have. We are hiring. Uh, my manager asked me to put this slide. Uh, he wouldn't otherwise let me speak, so. <laughs> and questions. <laughs> 